I could walk in at 8 o'clock and figure out what my sermon's going to be, but I don't want to sing this. It's all right. So, yeah. Um, with our, with our, I work with junior high and high school students. So, um, when I talk with junior high and high schoolers, one of the things that I, we talk about pretty much every year is uh, the topic on identity. Who are you? Because what I found is that high schoolers, junior highers, teenagers in general, are trying to figure that out, who they are. And the culture that surrounds them is pulling them in all sorts of different directions, trying to make them something that maybe they aren't. You know, whether it's sports or their teachers or their parents or the media or whatever, they, they're being pulled in all sorts of different directions. And the reality is that they, they really are coming to life going, who am I? Why am I here? And that this, this idea of identity is such an important topic to our teens. And so when I was thinking about, well, what should I share this morning to our congregation, um, such last minute and all this, and I looked at Jeff's notes, and I'm like, yeah, that can't work. I have no idea what he's even going to talk about. <laughs> so you guys can just check that out. The window. I don't even know. I, 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 don't, I didn't even see what the fill-ins were. All I saw were blanks, and I couldn't even fill in what the blanks were. It was off the top of my head, so I'm like, not going to happen. But we just finished a, a series on identity in junior high a few weeks ago, and then same in, we did one in high school as well. And so that's just been really fresh in my mind, and I just began to think, man, would this be something that the adults in our congregation, would this be something that would be meaningful to us as adults? And I'm thinking, yeah, absolutely. Because we as adults, I think we, get, we come to a lot of crossroads too as to who, who am I? What's my identity? I mean, I... I have the same issues too. I mean, I'm a youth pastor here at Good Sam, but I'm also like the go-to tech guy here, and so I kind of wear that hat, or I'm like dad of two kids. I'm also husband. I'm also the yard, you know, upkeep person and the keeper of, the, you know, lawnmowers to try and keep them running. It's like I, have, I wear all these hats, and I'm trying to switch them on and off, and it's like sometimes I wonder, like, well, who, yeah, I'm doing this task, but who am I really? And I think that's probably true for probably all of you, if you were to really be honest with yourself, that there are times when you really wonder, who am I really? What's my identity? You know, it, really, this is nothing new. Because really, from the very beginning, even Adam and Eve struggled with their identity. When Adam and Eve got placed in the garden with God, their identity was rock solid to start. They had the tightest bond, the tightest relationship with God. They walked in the garden of Eden with God daily and had conversations. God was showing them stuff. It was probably just so amazing. And their identity was rock solid. They were God's children that he created that relationship with him. And they knew that. But then something happened, and their relation, their identity was stolen. It's kind of like, it's kind of like this identity theft thing that we have going on in our in our country. You know, where someone swipes your 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 credit card number, and and pretty soon you realize that you own a boat and some house in Vegas, and it's like, what in the world happened? I don't have all that stuff, and pretty you know, it's like your identity's been just snatched away, and. That's what happened in the garden. So I've got a video to show you. Because Dave can't preach without a video, really. <laughs> um, and just, just to warn you, it's, it's, a, um, it's very artistic. Um, but every time, I, I show it to my students every couple of years, and every time they're like, oh, that's so amazing, and oh, that's so great. And even last hour, people were like, What's, how did you get that? So, um, but just one little thing, just super small, and it probably only like 1% of you even care about this, but uh, we, we own this video somewhere at our church. I just can't find the video, so I had to download it off of YouTube. So it's kind of like this copyright thing, but we own it, but it's got this um, little watermark in the back just so that you can't steal it or whatever, but so it kind of bothers me because I look at it all the time, but you probably won't even notice it. But just so you know, we do own the video, uh, but let's show it and just talk a little bit about our, our stolen identity. So Adam and Eve had it pretty good. Their identity was pretty solid. No guilt, no pain, no death, no work, nothing like that. Man, when 
And the serpent came on the scene. <coughs> Adam and Eve's relationship with God turned upside down. Their relationship with God changed forever. Their identity changed. But, and actually it affected all of us too, didn't it? Our identities have been changed. Okay. But they're not lost. Our identities have not been lost forever. Because God pursues each of us. And here's a spoiler. Our identity is in God. Because God created you. God created each and every person here. God gets to define who you are. God holds the blueprints to that. It's not the culture you live in. It's not the family you were raised in. It's not your work. It's none of that stuff. God gets to plan that out. And once we discover our true identity and where that is, we need to protect that. We have to protect our identity. You know, I think that the serpent is pretty active still today. Trying to steal people's identity, thinking, helping them think that they are someone that they're not. Try to undermine them. Just like someone stealing your credit card. So this morning, I want to take a look at this kid, David, and kind of take a look at his life and how he protected his identity. Because you see, when Dave, David, Dave, okay, when David was younger, I'll call him Dave, okay, when Dave was younger, uh, he, he was the youngest of a very large family. And we, if you just flip, if you flip the page one more over from where we're at, we we're in 1 Samuel 17, in just the chapter beforehand, we find, uh, we find David for the first time, and we find Samuel, um, who's a prophet, God told Samuel that he was going to anoint a new king over Israel. So he sends Samuel to David's house, okay? And you might remember this from Sunday school class and all, but I'll just remember it. So Samuel shows up to David's house, and he gets to meet all of David's brothers because Samuel knows that this king that God's going to anoint is going to come out of this house. Well, David is not in the house. David's doing his job attending the sheep and the goats out somewhere, out, you know, Moak Hill or something, attending those sheep out there far, far away. So Samuel, um, Samuel gets... All these brothers coming up to him, and he's checking them off the list, and he's like, God, is this the one? And God's like, no, no, that's not, the, not that guy. And so they get through all these brothers, and Samuel's like, so you got any more sons here? And because I'm kind of confused, because God said no to all of them. And so God says to Samuel, it's a great line, perfect, you got you to memorize this one. First Samuel 16, 7, the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or height. For I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. Judge. Now people judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And so Samuel's like, okay, so there's got to be someone else. And sure enough, they're like, well, there's David out there in the field. And he's like, great, bring him in. So they had to, and they were going to have this big feast. I'm telling you, this is this whole chapter. They're going to have this big dinner because Samuel's there and they're like, well, we're not going to eat anything until David gets back. So they, I don't know how long it took him to get back, but obviously it was quite a while. So finally he gets there and he's like, yes, that's the one. And he was anointed um, by Samuel to be the future king of Israel. Not right now. So David knew that he was chosen. He knew that God had something special for him and he knew his identity was in God. Pretty awesome. I wish that that would happen to me, right? And then after that, God kind of starts orchestrating things in David's life. And he ends up being this heart player for the current king, King Saul. And so he was actually in the palace a lot of the times with Saul. Playing the harp and doing stuff, comforting him. Because Saul was having crazy dreams and stuff. Um, and he, God was using David even in that current situation. But it was kind of this... Hold on, David. You're going to be king, but not yet. You're going to serve this king right now. And so then we pick up the story here. And one day, the Philistine army is coming to attack the Israelites, right? And you guys totally remember David and Goliath for Veggie Tail Days. No, you do. Because um, he was the giant pickle or whatever. And so I'm always reading out. Veggie Tales is 
either destroyed my view of Old Testament or like really enhanced it. <laughs> Not really sure which it is. Sometimes I wonder. But yeah, I always think it's Goliath that was this giant pickle. Um, but but we find that uh, we find that we got this 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 army and then this huge Goliath guy coming out and just taunting the the Israelite army and just making fun of them. And so he kind of made up this plan, like, look, we don't have to battle together. Just send out one person and I'll fight them. And then whoever wins, the other the other group will be slaves to the, to us or whatever. And so they, I don't know, so somehow the Israelites agreed to all that. They're agreeing to all these demands from these Philistines, and they're all scared to death of them. No one wanted to fight them. Forty days this this happened. So we have David, and David is uh, he's hanging out with his dad, and he's you know he's got to take care of the sheep and stuff while the while the you know military is all fighting this stuff or not fighting as the case may be. And so, but all of his brothers are out there fighting. They're all on the front lines doing doing the army thing. Um, and so David's dad says, hey, why don't you go, it's been a while, why don't you go check on your brothers and see how they're doing? So he sent David with some roasted grains and some bread and some cheese, and he's like, take all this stuff over to your brothers and just see how things are going. So he goes out there to the front lines, um, and he just, the first thing he sees, as soon as he walks up, it was right at the time of day when Goliath would come out and taunt the Israelites. And so David saw firsthand, he's like, whoa, this isn't right. And he just, I think there was something in his spirit that was like, this is not cool. Something needs to happen. And so he starts asking around, like, why are you letting this guy say this stuff about our God? What, why are you doing that? And he ends up finding his oldest brother, right? And he's, he asks him, why, why are you letting this happen? What are we going to do about this? And David's, uh, his brother taunts him. He's, he says, he's like, uh, he's like what, are you, what are you doing here? He says, You're, aren't you, don't you have some sheep to take care of? Aren't you, aren't you about those few sheep you're supposed to take care of? I know about your pride and your deceit. You just want to see the battle. That's what brother was saying to him. It's like, <clears throat> David's like, I don't have to put up with this. He really does. What have I done? So he's like, well, I'm going to go to my next brother. So he goes to his next brother. Well, what are you going to do about this? And the same thing. Next brother, next brother, next brother, down the line. And everybody's telling him the exact same thing. And until finally the word gets to King Saul that David's asking these questions. Then he gets invited to King Saul because nobody has an answer for David. It's amazing. So um, I just have two points that I'm going to make this morning. And, uh, and we're just going to go off of that. But the first thing that I just... I want everybody to not, I don't, I don't want you to leave here this morning without knowing this one thing, that David was God's kid. David knew that he was a child of God. And I want you guys to know that when you have a relationship with God through Jesus, you are an adopted son or daughter of God. How about that? You're yes. God's kid. No matter how old you are, you're still a kid. I was having this conversation with my son on the way home from the wedding last night because he's like, Dad, if you're going to have to preach tomorrow, what are you going to talk about? I'm like, I don't know. Maybe I'll talk about this. So we started talking about David and Goliath and how, man, when you, when you know God, you know Jesus, you're adopted into God's family. And when you're adopted as part of God's family, you get all of the benefits and the perks of being God's kid. How cool is that? You know, when, uh, when, I was, when I was a kid, I probably told you this story before, but I can't remember. So I'll tell it to you anyway. My dad, uh, I grew up in Reno, and my dad, uh, he's, he's retired now, but he used to be a dermatologist up in Reno. And so uh, I was always Dr. Stanley's son. That was my identity, Dr. Stanley's son. And sometimes it was like, oh, no, I actually was always a good thing when it was Dr. Stanley's son, even when I got pulled over in, in high school. Oh, are you Dr. Stanley's son? Yes, officer, I'm Dr. Stanley's son. That was a good thing, because he let me go. But that was totally different. But it wasn't just, oh, okay, have a nice day. It was, tell your dad I said hi. I'm like, oh, you know I'm not going to do that, right? So anyway, sometimes being Dr. Stanley's son wasn't all that good. And I don't know if you ever found out about that one. Uh, I'm sure he did, but he's such a great dad. He didn't, tell, he didn't talk to me about it. But the one thing that I remember um, is sometimes on Saturdays, my dad was on call at the hospital in Reno. And uh, I don't know, 
I, usually I was watching cartoons, that's all I remember on Saturdays, but sometimes my dad would go, hey Dave, you wanna go with me to the hospital? And so what, what little kid, nine, 10 year old, wouldn't wanna go hang out at a hospital with dad? Yeah, all right, but I did, and I remember my dad would bring me in, and he's like, all right, so you've got, I'm gonna go and make my rounds and meet with people, um, and I'm gonna leave you here in the doctor's lounge. I remember the doctor's lounge. I don't know if you know this, but in the hospitals, they have these special places where the doctors hang out and they lounge around when they're not working. And so I remember going to the doctor's lounge and, and he opened the door and here on the table were all these little, like those little cans of 7-Up and sodas were laid out. And then the fridge was open and there was food in the fridge and there was cookies and all sorts of great treats for the doctors. And my dad said, you're Dr. Stanley's son, so you get to stay here and have whatever you want. Here's the TV, here's the couch. And I used to just hang out in there while my dad was doing whatever he was doing. I was having a great time, and doctors would come in, and they're like, oh, you're Dr. Stanley's son. Like, oh, yeah. And so as Dr. Stanley's son, I had all the perks and the benefits of being my dad's son in the hospital. It was great. You know, when, uh, my, my family is working through a, a real life adoption right now. And our little little girl, Abby, you guys all know Abby, hopefully you've seen her. She's got a runny nose, so Betsy decided to keep her away from everyone who's getting sick and everything. So she's at home, but we're working through this adoption. Hopefully it'll be kind of official this summer. But, um, but I think about David being God's kid and how we get adopted into God's family. And it's like real life for us, having, having Abby. And, you know, when, when right, right now, it's not like official, so she's kind of like, we have to like play by all the rules of the state and all the county stuff and, you know, all that. But when, she, when we stand before the judge, when it's official and we sign the papers and the judge is like, all right, she's yours. You know, stamps it or whatever, signs it or whatever he does. I don't even know because it's our first time, but whatever he does to make it official, when we walk out of that courtroom, it's not going to be okay, well, what does our social worker want? Blah, blah, blah. No, she's going to be an official child of the Stanleys. She's, I don't know if that's good or not, but she's going to be a Stanley kid. She's going to be a pastor's kid, and that's going to be her, and she, she's going to have all the rights and benefits of being in our family. She doesn't necessarily, she has a little bit of a glimpse of it now, but when it's official, it's going to be, oh, so much better. You guys need to know just like David did, that you're adopted. You are God's kid. And we need to live into that. How many times do you get to remind yourself, all right, I'm God's kid. I can do this, right? Or, man, I'm God's kid. Should I be doing this? You know? Like, uh, but it kind of works either way, right? Uh, I don't know. Should I be speedy? I'm dad. I'm Dr. Stanley's kid. I just got pulled over. But I'm God's kid. That's even, that's even higher up there, you know? So, um, so yeah, that's one thing I wanted to remind us. The second one is, um, is that David knew that God was on his side. He knew that God was on his side. Now, he got anointed by Samuel early on when he was even younger. Um, and there, he just knew that he had this, some sort of this stamp from God that said, I've got a purpose for you. I'm going to fight for you because you have to make it through to be king. That means you have to make it through all of Saul's years, or when I choose to not have Saul around anymore, so that you can be king again. And David had to wait this out, because he wasn't king when he was a teenager. Okay, He had to wait it out, and it was this long time. And in fact, Saul got super jealous of David shortly after this whole battle happened, and Saul wanted to go out and kill David. In fact, he tried several, several times. If you read through Samuel, you get this whole picture of how Saul went from really loving David's heart plate skills to, I'm going to totally kill this kid because he thinks he's better than me. And so even that got all wrapped up to it. But David knew that God was on his side. And even, even on that battlefield with Goliath, did you notice on the battlefield? First off, he came up with a pretty amazing sermon on the fly. I have to say, that was pretty amazing. All that stuff that David said, that was awesome. You guys were cheering him, even, even while it was being read. You were like, yeah, stick it to him. <laughs> right? But, um, but David, he's on the battlefield, and Goliath is there. And Goliath starts like, all right, that's enough talk. And he starts walking out to him. And David 
runs to Goliath. This isn't like a, okay, this is reality. I better get up on stage now. You know, I'm, here I go. No, David, he ran to meet him. He knew that God was on his side. There was not a doubt in his head or in his heart for that matter that God wasn't going to fight for him. And, you know, even with all of the disrespect that was thrown at him by his brothers, even all that stuff that Goliath was throwing at him and, you know, cursing him by their gods and all that stuff and mocking him and all that stuff, just it didn't cause any fear for him. It didn't rock David's world like they thought it was because David protected his identity. He knew who he was. He went out into battle. He knew God was going to fight for him because he was God's kid. And that's what's going to happen. So no doubts at all. Um, and he knew that God had created him for a purpose. And that God loved him deeply. So for us, when you have a relationship with God through Jesus, you are adopted into God's family. So there's a lot of this story that is totally us too. You are God's kid. God's going to fight for you. What are you afraid of? What are you afraid of? You know, what, what people are in your life who are causing you to doubt your identity? What situations are you in that are doubting, that are causing you doubt that you are a child of God? There's probably all sorts of stuff. You know, are there people in your life, are there people in your life that are strengthening your identity? They're building into you and encouraging you? Or are there people that are weakening that identity and being like David's brothers? Ah, whatever, you should be out. You should be out doing dishes. You should be out mowing the grass. What are you doing? It's all, you know, whatever. No. And my last question, maybe this is the best one. If you could do something big for God, even right now, this week, what would you do? Is that what's holding you back? Is it fear? The resources, time, nothing held David back. He knew he was God's kid. He knew God was going to fight for him. Let's pray.